Okay. Thank All right. You. Sorry for the. Uh, uh, no, no problem. There's always some technical issues. I'm glad we figured it out. Um, and I hope I'm not going to butcher your name. Uh, it's Dr. Andre Nail. It, did, did I say it right? Correct. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, sorry for, um, I guess we should start. I, I know people are still trickling in um, and maybe some people are lost because of the new link today um, and the new time, but um, I should get started here. Uh, thanks uh, to everyone for uh, coming to another COVID seminar. Um, today, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andre Nail. Um, he's a distinguished professor of medicine, chief of division of nanomedicine, research director of uh, 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 CNSI, and the director of UC Center for Environmental Impact of Nanotechnology, which is a premier think tank for the safe and sustainable implementation of nanotechnology in the US. He is also the associate editor for ACS Nano. So um, it's very impressive to read um, uh, uh, Dr. Nell's uh, 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 CV. He's really the, the godfather of uh, nanotechnology and uh, nanomedicine. Um, he was a recipient of the Harry Truman Award uh, and California Governor's Environmental Economic Leadership Award. Um, he, he clearly plays a very important uh, a national uh, leadership role in um, uh, all the different aspects of nanotechnology safety and policy. Uh, he was an NSF panel member for producing a comprehensive U.S. government blueprint for nanotechnology development in the U.S. Uh, from 2010 to 2020. And I thought it was really impressive that um, he was, um, he's a member of the U.S. Bilateral Presidential Commission for Technology Cooperation Russia, um, and he was also a panel member on President Obama's PCAST panel for strategize, stra strategic, uh, strategizing the NNI technological innovation and commercialization. Um, and the list goes on and on. Um, uh, let, let's not go through the whole list. <laughs> <laughs> and, and no one is more perfect than he is um, to address the question that he's going to tell us more today, uh, since his current research focuses on targeting the immune system by nanoparticles um, to treat cancer and a range of uh, allergic and autoimmune diseases. So please take it away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about COVID vaccination, um, <clears throat> drawing on major progress in nanotechnology. So nanotechnology and nanomedicine now comes full term with the participation in the current uh, COVID vaccination uh, era. So nanoparticles in the immune system, which is the area of my focus, can be engineered to either avoid interactions or specifically interact with the immune system. And in the process, you can therefore use them to provide either immune stimulation or immune suppression. And the ability to do so in the engineering of the nanomaterials where it meets the immune system at that nanobio interface, the structuring of nanoparticles, shape, size, a charge, etc. Uh, can modify the function of the immune system. I show one example from uh, our previous studies. If you take alum, which is a frequently used adjuvant in the immune system, and instead of as amorphous particles, produce it as aluminum nanorods, uh, dendritic cells senses the shape and size of these materials in order to devise a danger signal that drives a much stronger adjuvant immune response. In the era of COVID vaccine considerations, the important principles that apply that I will talk about today is the correct choice of an antigen to drive antibody and T cell responses. This could be the whole organism, a subunit of the organism, or even epitopes in the case of uh, proteins. You require an adjuvant as I just uh, um, described for alum, that is important um, in order to activate the uh, innate or the primitive immune system to be able to provide antigen presentation to T and B cells. And then other important, another important consideration is the manufacturing scalability and cost of the vaccine design. So what ideally a nanoparticle can do is to simulate 
a natural COVID viral infection, which if you um, take the COVID viral particle enters epithelial cells by spike protein binding to an ACE receptor. Once inside the cells, the viral RNA is released, is translated into protein, assembles into new viral particles, which budge through the membrane to uh, infect additional cells. One of the cell types that is infected by the viral particle are the antigen presenting cells of the immune system where the translated proteins via MHC gene products is presented to helper T cells and B cells to produce the anti-corona antibody that's uh, important for prevention of viral binding or tagging it for destruction. Another important feature is the activation of cytotoxic T cells, which have the important function to assist the antibodies in destroying the infected cells and to provide viral clearance. An additional important feature uh, of the vaccine is also to develop long-lived memory B and T cells for durable, immun uh, durable immunity. So the World Health Organization now catalogs um, more than 169 different COVID vaccine candidates, um, among which are contemporary vaccine technologies that I will briefly cover, not much to say about this, live attenuated viruses, inactivated viruses, or viral vector vaccines. The area of my focus today will be in a new range of vaccines that is developed through the use of nanotechnology to deliver DNA constructs, RNA constructs, as well as peptide and uh, proteins. A brief word about the live attenuated and inactivated viral vaccines. Here, we use the whole pathogen, weakened or killed. An example of the uh, live uh, inactivated vaccines is the codogenic intranasal vaccine. These vaccines generally are highly potent for making humoral and cellular immunity. Um, the live inactivated virus can be uh, administered as a single dose. Theoretical safety concerns for these viruses uh, is that they can revert back to the pathogenic form, reactivate an immune deficient people or can recombine with circulating wild type viruses. There is however no indication that this has happened with any of the uh, current vaccine. On the other hand, uh, the inactivated viruses is an example of the Sinovac uh, vaccine, potentially safer than the live viruses, but less immunogenic, and also requires uh, the administration of an adjuvant. For instance, the Sinovac vaccines uh, use uh, alum. A brief word about the viral vector vaccines. These vaccines use live viruses in which genes have been inactivated to prevent replication, and the virus delivers the DNA or nucleic acid that subscribes uh, for the antigen, for instance, a corona spike protein. Non-replicating adenoviral vectors are currently being used, and this includes a few examples that are shown here, such as the Can Sino Vaccine Beijing Institute or Canadian Center for Vaccinology. Um, a current example that is in clinical trials in the US is to use a chimpanzee adenoviral vector. Um, this is in the vaccine by uh, Oxford and AstraZeneca. The advantages of these vaccines, broad tissue tropism, inherent adjuvant properties and scalability. Potential disadvantages is pre-existing immunity to adenoviruses, which may damp uh, dampen the efficacy. In general, these vaccines have been, uh, in recent publications, been shown to be safe in the preclinical phase and also uh, in the case of uh, the Oxford vaccine have been shown initially in phase one studies to be safe, but we now know that in a later phase that there was one serious uh, adverse event that put the vaccine temporarily uh, on hold. What I'm gonna be talking about is the next generation of nano-enabled vaccines for DNA delivery, RNA delivery, as well as uh, uh, epitopes and peptides. These vaccines uh, are useful because they perform viral mimicry. 
they entrap and protect the bioactive nucleic acids. Antigen presenting cells prefer the uh, particulate antigens. Uh, possible for uh, multi-cargo loading to deliver antigens, nucleic acids, and adjuvants. Control over biodegradability, control over biodistribution, as well as the intracellular re release of the antigen and MHC presentation, and also provide scalable manufacturing. The advantages of the nucleic acid vaccines is this is a novel vaccine concept, not yet FDA approved, but hopefully will happen soon for some of the vaccines that is currently being looked at. Uh, advantages are speed, scalability, and reduced costs. You can use it to either deliver DNA or RNA. DNA requires electroporation. RNA can be delivered via nanoparticle. These vaccines, all the antigens are processed because of the particular delivery to simulate what I've shown you earlier on for the um, natural virus. The vaccines can generate antibody, CD4, CD8 T cell responses, and then the nucleic acids also have an intrinsic adjuvant activity by themselves. Examples of DNA, COVID, and RNA vaccines are shown at the bottom, of which the one that uh, currently receives a lot of attention is the Moderna vaccine, but there are also other vaccines. Use of messenger RNA over DNA has theoretical advantages in that RNA uh, only needs to enter the cytosol and not the nucleus, so there's no genome integration. It does not have to be labeled as gene therapy. RNA is quickly degraded, can be synthesized rapidly and with rapid purification and has lower cost because there's no cell or protein requirements. The RNA can either be non-amplifying, where it only delivers a single strand, or be made as self-amplifying constructs where um, in addition uh, to the antigen, you also use viral replication machinery to amplify uh, RNA amplification and protein expression. Now here is where nanotechnology comes in, um, in terms of being able to deliver these nucleic acids with an, uh, a series of very um, refined design features. I will be briefly discussing to you the design of the nucleic acid of uh, part of the vaccine, the packaging of the vaccine by nanoparticles that are specifically uh, equipped with lipid components to deliver that vaccine, as well as the ability of the nanoparticle when entering the cell to release that RNA so that it can be transcribed uh, without damage to the cell. So first, let me begin with the antigen and tell you where the background uh, comes for the current va uh, vaccines. And that is lessons from the MERS and SARS viruses and the importance of the spike protein. SARS, the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus emerged in 2003, case fatality rate of 14 to 15%. MERS, was the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, which emerged in 2012 with a case fatality rate of 36%. What we've learned from these uh, viruses was that the spike protein was important for receptor recognition, membrane fusion, and uptake, and that the S protein and its domains was also used as a target for making neutralizing antibodies, but required smart design of the S protein in order to make sure that it is in a maximum immunogenic conformation. What I'm talking about is described here. First, let me just tell you that the spike protein is only one of the viral proteins which currently receives a lot of attention, but we also need to consider, as I will tell you soon, the importance of the nucleocapsid membrane and envelope proteins. When the virus buds from the cell, uh, the importance of the spike protein after proteolytic cleavage is to provide entry, as I've shown in an earlier slide. When the gene was cloned for the spike protein, it was revealed that it consists of an S2 and a trimeric S1 subunit. It is the S1 subunit that interacts 
with the membrane receptors, the ACE receptors for uptake. Once this crystal structure became known for the S1 subunit, it was revealed that the specific binding event requires a receptor binding domain for uptake. And the receptor binding domain is of key importance in terms of immunogenicity because it can either lie down on the S1 unit, subunit or stand up. The stand up formation is very important for the RDB to reach out to bind to the ACE uh, receptor after protease uh, cleavage uh, of the virus. Once one subunit is available for binding to the ACE receptor, uh, a second subunit is released, stands up, then a third, and then ultimately the virus is internalized. Now, why I'm showing this is that in the stand up conformation, um, all the epitopes that are covered under the hinge region are exposed and ready for immunogenic activity. If, however, the RDB lies down, most of the epitopes are covered up. So a lot of the vaccine design then went into providing a nucleic acids that are mutationally stabilized to provide the antigen in the stand-up formation. Of all the efforts that have been undertaken, um, the most um, successful was to provide mutation on the furin cleavage site plus two proline mutations in the S2 domain, which allows the trimeric subunit to be permanently in the stand-up position to expose its epitopes. And this negative stain uh, electron micrograph shows the mutated MERS and SARS proteins compared to wild type where you have both the pre and the post fusion formation. With the nucleic acid being um, defined, important designs of the nucleic acid was the design of the five prime and three prime untranslated regions, as well as the um, base pair compositions, specifically chemically modifying the uridine to provide a stable RNA and to provide an RNA that also provides uh, important adjuvant events. So examples of conventional non-amplifying messenger RNA vaccines are the vaccine from Moderna, the vaccine from Pfizer, whereas the self-amplifying uh, or replicon RNA being developed by Acutus Pharmaceuticals and Arcturus. Having the nucleic acid available, the next step in the vaccine design was to design the nanoparticle by making use of lipid nanoparticles, and specifically lipid nanoparticles that include a cationic ionizable lipid component, which is specifically designed with a head group and a linker to bind the, uh, so the positively charged lipid binding the negative nucleic acid. And not only binding it, but constructing a lipid bilayer that differs from a normal liposome, where the phospholipids are spaced to give a cylindrical um, uh, arrangement to allow them to package into a lipid bilayer. With the cationic uh, lipid design, the formation assumes a cone-shaped uh, structure, which does not want to fold into a lipid bilayer, but favors the formation of these penny rolls, or what is also known as a hexagonal complex. And all of this is done by a clever microfluidics uh, technology, which at high level can allow in one inlet um, the delivery of the RNA. The other side allows the delivery of ethanol and lipids with a very effective uh, mixing uh, so that you can get high content uh, development. First, the cationic lipid binds to the negative, the charged RNA. And this allows the hydrophobic inverted micelles to stand out with the RNA in the middle. With increased polar mixing as the solvents come in, polar lipids then start to coat the outside of the precipitates that form, ultimately coalescing into an electron-dense core um, in which the uh, 
core is surrounded by a lipid monolayer. Now this lipid monolayer that contains the cationic lipids is very important because if the particle is taken up by the antigen presenting cells, this allows the pennyroll formation to occur where the cationic lipid allows fusion with the endosomal membrane and then ultimately the release of the RNA also assisted by turning on a proton pump as a result of the cationic charge uh, in that nanoparticle. Ultimately, um, the inclusion of the nucleic acid and the cationic lipids uh, completes the picture by providing important adjuvant effects at the inoculation site. Uh, in order to present the vaccine to the immune system at the injection site, you require inflammation. That inflammation is then derived from the presence of the design of the nucleic acids and the cationic lipids, which provide danger signals that are picked up by a number of uh, danger signal receptors such as toll receptors. These act as sensors uh, for cytokine and chemokine production, which is responsible for influx of antigen presenting cells, and then also provides danger signals to the dendritic cells to mature and be able to present the antigen to the immune system. The design of the nanoparticle size, shape, and charge is also important to make sure that it facilitates access to the regional lymph node. Okay, so what I've now described to you the design. What have we learned then from the vaccine studies that was performed with MERS and CoV-1 vaccines using the S protein or the receptor binding domain? Um, these vaccines were successfully developed uh, for delivering the S protein and the receptor binding domain. Animal studies showed that it was quite effective for inducing neutralizing antibody titers that could block viral binding and membrane fusion and provide protective immunity. However, a very important finding that few people know about in terms of the current vaccine the development is while successful in generating neutralizing antibody titers, CoV-1 and MERS vaccines also had severe immune side effects at the time when the animals were challenged with the live virus. And that also needs to be taken into consideration for the current vaccine design. These adverse effects of the MERS and CoV-1 vaccines are of two types. One is antibody-mediated enhancement, and the other is a cellular-mediated uh, adverse effect in the lung that's driven by eosinophils. The antibody-mediated side effects was due to the vaccine-making IgG-type of non-neutralizing antibodies, which assisted viral uptake uh, into uh, various different uh, tissue types, including monocytes and macrophages, where it not only enhanced the infection, but also excited in the endosomal compartment through danger signals, the production of cytokines and chemokines. The other adverse effect first detailed in developing respiratory syncytial virus vaccines for children was the excitation of a severe immune-mediated eosinophil influx, where these vaccines in various different uh, formations, such as inactivated or subunit vaccines, led to post-vaccine enhancement with, with serious lung damage due to the eosinophil recruitment. This occurred across multiple animal models. And um, it was noticed that the side effects was less if you use S protein binding domain or Th1 skewing adjuvants when making the vaccine. In order to explain those immune side effects, uh, the uh, <clears throat> common interpretation is, is that due to certain viral components such as nucleocapsid protein, Th2 adjuvant, and also aging of the immune system, that these vaccines, instead of the desired Th1 skewing of the immune system, where you generate cytotoxic T cells in an environment that produces interferon gamma, 
and provides class switching of IgG 2A producing B cells, you promote instead a Th2 mediated immune screen where the production of IL-4, IL-5 uh, is responsible for the recruitment of eosinophils and for switching on B cell class switching that produces IgG1. So an important solution then is to develop vaccines that provide Th1 skewing. This can be done through the design of the nucleic acid backbone, use of S protein and RDB as compared to other um, protein types, as well as the inclusion of Th1 uh, skewing adjuvants, for instance, um, lipid components that drive the toll receptor uh, pathway. So as one example then of how this all comes together, for instance, the mRNA-1273 that develops the pre-fusion complex by Moderna. Um, antibody studies in mice showed that these vaccines were capable of inducing a very strong antibody response, which had a strong component of neutralizing antibodies that uh, prevented viral infection uh, of the lung. Spleens from these animals revealed that there was a balanced production of IgG1 and IgG2A. Um, and splenocytes also showed that there was a predominance of IL, uh, interferon gamma over IL-4 production, so a Th1 skewing of the immune response. Uh, interestingly, uh, in the <coughs> preclinical studies, they also uh, did vaccination with just the S protein in the presence of alum. In this particular instance, um, the uh, production of the IgG increased, so it became an unbalanced immune response where the ratio of IgG2A to IgG dropped and the uh, immune phenotype signature um, <coughs> drifted towards Th2 skewing with IL-4 uh, dominating. When tested in humans um, by uh, injection into the deltoid muscle, uh, the vaccine that I just described to you, after injection on uh, day one, there was a rapid rise in antibody titers and a rapid accrual of neutralizing antibody titers after the second vaccination uh, on day 29. The vaccine generated potent uh, titers to the pre-fusion uh, complex, which correlated with strong antibody response to the receptor binding domain, viral neutralizing antibodies, and then the peripheral blood, the induction of a, a Th1 skewed immune response dominated by the presence of interferon gamma IL-2 and uh, tumor necrosis factor. Moreover, the vaccine was also uh, showed very few side effects uh, in um, the uh, preclinical studies. Okay, so if we now ask in terms of what we've learned from actual natural infections with SARS and CoV-2 uh, patients, how does this correlate with the uh, current vaccination uh, uh, efforts? And natural infections confirm the immune dominance of RDB and viral S protein in protective immunity. Most symptomatic COVID patients develop anti-RDB antibodies by day nine. There's a good correlation of these antibody RDB titers with neutralizing antibody activity. But importantly, in many of these studies, people have now noticed that 33% of people develop a poor neutralizing uh, antibody response. For those that did develop a good or anti-RDB IgG in convalescent serum. This was a good promise uh, the, for protection. And in fact, an RDB ELISA assay could be used to, defend, to, to as a good predictive tool for identifying plasma for people in the convalescent plasma serum donor series. Importantly, however, in, in recent community studies, is to recognize that antibody responses were not detectable in a sizable fraction 
of highly impacted populations, especially with less severe or asymptomatic infections, prompting the important questions, are these people unprotected? Do T cells make a difference? And can we think about this in terms of further vaccine design? Before talking about the T cells, let me briefly uh, also tell you about recent observations about the duration of the neutralizing antibody response. Antibodies against the CoV-1 and MERS-2 virus um, lasted two to three years compared to antibodies to seasonal coronavirus, which are short-term responses, only last for weeks and allows reinfection. Early indications for CoV-2 humoral immunity, including a study done here at UCLA by Otto Yang and his group, showed that the CoV-2 antibodies were of shorter duration. For instance, an anti-RDB antibody had a serum half-life of 36 days. So the current expectation is that vaccines for generating the neutralizing antibodies will provide a viable option for SARS uh, herd immunity. However, I also want you to recall what I said earlier on, while neutralizing antibodies block viral entry, CD8 T cells are required to eliminate infected cells and provide viral clearance. T cells also confer durable immune memory against conserved viral antigens other than S protein and RDB domain. So we also need to consider other viral components. And then also important to consider that some of the best vaccines that have ever been developed, durable vaccine responses to smallpox and measles, are benchmarks which demonstrates the importance of B cell memory development with the assistance of T cell help. So this raises um, important questions. How much emphasis is needed for vaccine strategies for T cells, memory B cells, and conserved viral regions? Can memory T and B cells protect? And if they can protect, how do they protect against an acute viral disease with a short incubation period? A brief word then on recent studies on the importance of T cell immunity in convalescent individuals and people with uh, asymptomatic or mild COVID, COVID uh, infections. In a recent Swedish cohort study, it was demonstrated that COVID-2 specific CD4 and CD8 T cell responses uh, appear during the acute infection phase and correlates uh, well with a highly activated cytotoxic phenotype. In convalescent blood, T cells were also demonstrated to have a polyfunctional and a durable display of a CCR7 memory phenotype. Remember that CCR7, I'll come back to that. Another important observation that durable and functional memory T cells were also detectable in convalescent subjects with asymptomatic or mild infections and even in exposed zero negative family members. Moreover, memory T cell responses were driven by nucleocapsid membrane protein in addition to the role of S protein. These findings have recently also uh, been confirmed by Lebert et al. Uh, in a Nature article. And in a recent BMJ feature article, Peter Doshi um, has demonstrated that at least six major studies have reported T cell reactivity against SARS-CoV-2 in 20 to 50% of people with no known exposure to the virus. You will notice most of these uh, publications that um, I show you have been published over the last two to three months. So that then calls the attention to, could we do something in addition to just neutralizing antibody titers? Uh, from the studies also recently from Grafoni, Hammett and Gautier, um, there have been mapping of multiple B and T cell epitopes to CoV-2, S1 nucleoprotein, and conserved viral epitopes. It demonstrated 
that the immune dominant B and T cell epitopes are shared by CoV1. B cell epitopes, very helpful for straight uh, ability of vaccine design because they are more universal, do not require HLA restricted uh, uh, antigen presentation. However, for T cell epitopes, uh, major histocompatibility presentation is required, but from the studies of Ahmed and Gautier, they have shown that the T cell epitopes can be identified to cover multiple MHC alleles that are representative of, in the case of Ahmed, up to 96% of the population, in the case of Gautier, the design of peptides where at least four peptide uh, epitopes uh, could cover 100% of the population. The advantage of epitope design for vaccine development is that it is relatively inexpensive, scalable, safe, can be, desired, can be designed to uh, drive humoral and T-cell based immunization. A combination of both could be included in the same vaccine and that there's also large scale web-based epitope mapping database is now available to allow iterative design of these vaccines if required. So I'm gonna then introduce you the last type of nano-enabled vaccine design, namely protein and peptide uh, or viral-like nanoparticles. The nanoparticles or the viral-like particles deliver structural components of CoV-2 including the S protein, S1 and S2 subunits, the receptor binding domain or epitopes of these viruses. Example vaccines include Novavax, Sanofi, Johnson & Johnson and the Hoya Institute vaccine. Multiple different nanoparticle types are being used such as liposomes, polymers and lipid nanoparticles. Moreover, a major advance have been the development of viral-like particles which are constructed through the assembly of mammalian, insect, or plant viral proteins. As one example, iBio, as tobacco or plant virus particles, are comprised of self-assembly proteins that are produced in um, uh, upscaled amounts by a fast farming technology. The viral-like particles are generally very potent, but can raise antiviral antibodies that could cross-react with other viruses and interfere. All of the above formulations um, include non-nucleic acid adjuvants um, and can also be designed for targeting of the viral particle to specific areas of the lymph node. I'll demonstrate one example in a moment. The widespread use of epitope mapping and informatic tools um, predicting peptide sequences will uh, enable the development of these vaccines for raising B and T cell responses to one or more epitopes. Uh, too early to tell you what the success of these vaccines is. Most of them are still uh, being tested out and we do not have uh, ex uh, clinical trials as yet. As one example of what can be accomplished, we uh, performed in a CNSI is to design a, such a subunit vaccine by uh, making use of a polymer nanoparticle, which incorporates subunits or epitopes of the virus together with a very potent Th1 adjuvant plus targeting motifs when injected in mice after two injections successful raising of an IgM antibody response. In this case, I show you the RDB subunit vaccine, which was much stronger if we used an IgG1 adjuvant. Um, after the third injection, the isotype of the antibody, which was originally negative on day 21, switched to an IgG isotype that was uh, sustained. Um, I will finally just tell you where I think the epitope vaccines may be going to, as we still have to collect data on the actual deliver of peptide epitopes, it is possible to also do the same 
as I have shown you for nucleic acids by the development of mini gene nucleic acid platforms for multivalent uh, vaccine constructs to generate D and uh, B and T cell responses and that is scalable. I'm talking here about the concept of string of bead vaccines in which epitope mapping for an infectious agent, for instance, can define candidate epitopes and flanking region um, with spacers that could be uh, constructed as a mini gene, which if translated leads to cor correctly cleaved combination of epitopes. In a recent uh, study by Markovic, also published uh, very recently, um, they have developed 65, 33 mer peptide sequences to diverse B and T cell epitopes that can be delivered in tandem with Th1 adjuvants. The epitope selection is for evolutionary conserved plus variable regions of the virus. Epitope selection to be presented by diverse HLA uh, gene products to be able to stimulate CD4 and CD8 T cells. Also selection of linear and conformational B cell epitopes and the overall design selection of viral regions with the highest degree of dissimilarity to the self immunopeptidome to provide the maximum immunogenicity. So string of bead vaccines have been shown experimentally to be very successful for vaccination um, for uh, cytomegalovirus and influenza. And I will not be surprised if in the near future, this technology, in case the other vaccines do not drive durable long T cell responses may provide an alternative vaccine platform for SARS-2. My final two slides, I want to briefly just to show you another important discovery that I think pertains to nanotechnology. Um, and that is the fact that durable immunity in COVID patients requires T and B cell cooperation in lymph node germinal centers. And this process is functionally disrupted in COVID-19. So the basis of this is that the lymph node germinal centers as shown here in this fluorescent slide under normal conditions plays a very important role where the CCR positive memory T cells give rise to a, a helper cell type known as a follicular helper T cell or TFH which enters the germinal center where together with follicular dendritic cells is able to drive the class switching of the type of B cells that make long lived uh, uh, B cell uh, antibody production. And so um, Parodi in a recent um, a study in COVID patients uh, used um, uh, biopsy materials to demonstrate that in COVID patients, the lymph node structure is acutely disrupted. The germinal centers are poorly formed and have a low presence of the follicular helper T cells. A critical vaccinology need that have been uh, defined is the development of vaccine platforms and adjuvants that target the follicular helper cells to the germinal center. So it is fortuitous that in studies undertaken with nucleic acid delivering nanoparticles, party at all, in developing vaccination for Zika, influenza, and HIV vaccines have shown that this vaccine type has a potent ability to make the uh, THF cells available to the germinal center for driving durable immune responses. These results were also corroborated um, in rhesus monkeys in developing an influenza vaccine. Okay, that's the one side of the story now. Where does nano uh, come into this? Well, um, recent study by Daryl Irvine shows the importance of nanoparticle design with the principle of glycosylation. 
shown in Daryl studies where he develops HIV GP120 vaccines. If you deliver the GP120, which is colored red in this picture, to the regional lymph node, it enters into the subcapsular sinus, but does not go into the germinal centers. If, however, the GP120 is encapsulated by a polymerizing protein that's very rich in glycans, the glycans uh, are shown here in, in green, you do have a system that effectively delivers in the germinal center the HIV GP120 in the presence of follicular dendritic cells and germinal center B cells. I'm not going to uh, bore you with all the details, but the secret of the success is that the glycosylation um, activates a complement pathway through the binding of a mannose binding lectin protein to the particle surface, which promotes the uh, improved vaccine development. And the importance of the glycosylated proteins is demonstrated by the fact that the CoV2 RDB and a number of related viruses that also make use of class one fusion glycoproteins to enter, like the spike protein, for instance, influenza and HIV, are all heavily glycosylated. So glycosylation appears to play an important role. My final slide is to, to just um, talk about the issue of vaccine-induced natural selection um, that may impact the maintenance of immunity in the case of pandemic persistence. Uh, fortunately, the COVID-2 virus has very good genetic proof le reading, which predicts that there will be low sequence diversions, uh, diversity and a risk of reinfections. However, in the studies of COVID-1 and MERS, it's been shown that natural selection can, on rare occasions, favor, favor mutations of the RDB uh, domain that could provide escape from neutralizing antibody efficiency. In a recent publication, Dr. Betty Kerber, looking at COVID-2 patients, describes an S1 domain mutation that occurred at a site where that governs the furin cleavage site that makes the stand-up conformation possible, and also demonstrated that this particular mutation within that came about within one month as the virus migrated from China to Europe produced a virus that had a much higher rate of viral shedding. And so this opens the possibility that with pandemic persistence, the accumulation of immunologically relevant mutations in the population uh, can accumulate uh, as the vaccines are introduced. An important resource then is uh, that Dr. Cobra designed a bioinformatics tool that provides an early warn warning strategy to evaluate spike protein evolution uh, during the pandemic. Finally, I want to just acknowledge uh, the people from my laboratory who contributed uh, towards our own work and our studies uh, on nanotechnology. I'm not going to go through the whole list. And I also want to um, briefly acknowledge the important contribution of CNSI to developing the various areas of nanotechnology, including nanomedicine, and the success that we have achieved with our philosophy of translating basic discovery into leverage investment with an entrepreneurship platform, as well as a very um, successful facilitation uh, proposal unit that have um, had a large success funding rate uh, over the last three years. Thank you very much, happy to take questions. Great, thank you so much for a very comprehensive uh, uh, review of all the vaccine strategies. Um, I guess we'll open the floor up for um, questions. Um, if anyone has a question, please uh, type it in the chat box or uh, unmute yourself. 
And I guess I will start with one first. So, um, Andre, I thought the string of bead uh, concept for vaccine design is really cool. Um, so do you envision that may, with nanotechnology and I guess bioinformatics, um, you could make a vaccine that will be broadly active for all kinds of viruses, um, since you can bioinformatically uh, maybe tease apart the epitope um, sort of selection and just make a vaccine that hopefully could sort of stimulate very broad um, B and T cell response? I think that, um, you know, first, I think we're in a phase now where there's a heavy, heavy emphasis on those vaccines that I've shown you that's in clinical trials. And hopefully for us, these vaccines um, will be effective. And there's very good indications that they hit all the sweet spots. Um, in case, however, we find that um, there is a problem with durability or, a vac uh, or, or not enough vaccines because of side effects, um, the use of nano-enabled scale-up, such as the string of bead vaccines, I think becomes a, 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 a very real possibility. Mm -hmm. A very real possibility, not only for doing it with rapid lead time, mm -hmm. but will also then serve as the basis for you know, developing a whole new generation of vaccines that we can only envisage at the moment uh, by the correct uh, choice of, uh, of, of complementary subunits. I will also say that what we now learn about areas in the world, uh, as reviewed in the BMJ article that was um, recently heavily infected, but where a lot of the people do not have antibodies but have reactive T cells, uh, also uh, indicates to us that there are areas of vaccination that we don't traditionally think about that is now ready uh, to be exploited. That's great. Thank you. And I think um, we have a question from Janet Winnikoff. Um, she's asking, is any of this technology applicable to developing treatments? Um, <clears throat> If you, uh, are you talking about um, treatments in general or treatment for a specific purpose? Because I can tell you <laughs> that a lot of these nanoparticles, uh, our nanoparticles that I've shown you, as well as the historical lipid delivering nanoparticles actually have been developed in another domain of nanomedicine, namely a cancer treatment. And so, um, by making use then of smart, the smart design features that I've shown you, you can actually uh, deliver um, uh, uh, vaccination to cancer. You can actually deliver adjuvants uh, to cancer. You can actually deliver um, uh, expressed nucleic acids that um, modify the cancer environment. And, um, if you recall that in my second slide, I showed that you can actually use nanoparticles to both drive the immune system as well as to suppress the immune system. And then yes, so on that side, we also have a, the same nanoparticles that could be targeted uh, to tolerogenic antigen presenting cells in the liver, where if you take the vaccine there with an antigen, it uh, drives the development of regulatory T cells that could go out into the periphery to switch off serious allergic reactions as well as autoimmune disease processes. So we've, as one of that um, <clears throat> CNSI multi-team uh, workforces that we've developed, we've developed a tolerogenic nanoparticle workforce for treatment of allergies and uh, autoimmune disease with a number of members from the School of Medicine participating. Great. Thank you. Is there any other question? Ah, we have one more question from Suraj Bhatt. Which has more side effects immun immunologically, delivery of nucleic acids or the protein um, and epitopes? Well, 
it's 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 a yin and yang. There's a, there's a balance in that. The nucleic acids clearly allows a technology that can be scaled up much uh, better than uh, uh, use of proteins and I would say also of peptides. Although peptides could go a lot faster uh, than proteins. When it comes to the development of side effects, I think that the entire vaccine design and the direction that it takes the immune system could do good, but we've also shown that if you skew the immune response, you can get adverse effects. Which one is more prone to develop that? I think that in terms of all the design components that are thrown together, I think that uh, both vaccine types would have potential advantages and disadvantages. Fortunately for us at the moment, it would seem that the choice now of the nucleic acid vaccines have uh, generated a new era um, of, of vaccine development that I certainly hope for all of us uh, will work out in developing safe vaccines. That's great. And, and I guess um, I just want to also make a comment, Andre, is that I was very, I, I thought it was fascinating that the glycosylation of the HIV nanoparticles directs it to the germinal centers, because normally with HIV being so heavily glycosylated, it's actually a bad thing for the immune yeah. system. But in this case, it's actually great because you have a very direct immune response. Exactly, as you say. So uh, and normally glycosylation is, uh, um, has the tendency to silence, mm -hmm. um, you know, antigenicity. But if in the context of a particulate um, substance, such as a nanoparticle, that um, has the glycosylated products on its surface, where it activates a complement cascade, the sequence of events there is to actually traffic the antigen to a place that it otherwise will not go. Yeah, no, I think it's fascinating. Uh, it's cool with the mechanism. So, great. So I see if there's no more question, thank you so much, Andre, for a great presentation. And uh, I believe next week we do not have a seminar. So we will resume again in two weeks. So uh, have a good weekend, everyone. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andre. Well, thank um, you very much. I'm glad we got that uh, done. Out. Yeah, I'm glad everything went smoothly. <laughs> Thanks so much for a st stimulating talk. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>